Gospel of Luke, chapter 9. Luke, chapter 9. Um, uh, so we, uh, we just move through the Scripture section by section, uh, studying the whole book together, seeking the Spirit's message. And um, our sermon text today um, begins in verse 10, which had an overlap from the end of last week's sermon. What I'm going to do is just read um, from the beginning of the chapter, skipping out a little bit about Herod, uh, just for context. So, uh, Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Uh, and just before I read, I'm going to pray for God's help. Again, our Father, we lift up our voices to you. Lord, we were once blind until you took us by the hand and you opened our eyes and gave us sight. And we would still be blind today were it not for your sustaining, life-giving grace. And we pray, Lord, that we would move deeper, Lord, into the knowledge of Christ, the knowledge of salvation. We pray that we all together would move on. Wherever we are in the journey, Lord, lead us further, we pray, that we would love him and that we would know comforts from him. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Then Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, Take nothing for the journey, neither staffs, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And whoever will not receive you, when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet as a testimony against them. So they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. And the apostles, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. Then he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him, and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had need of healing. When the day began to wear away, the twelve came and said to him, Send the multitudes away, that they may go into the surrounding towns and country, and lodge and get provisions, for we are in a deserted place here. But Jesus said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about five thousand men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Make them sit down in groups of fifty. And they did so, and made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate and were filled, and twelve baskets of leftover fragments were taken up by them. Amen. Thanks be to God uh, for his word. Uh, there is uh, no meal for me like uh, my mom's uh, Christmas dinner, uh, the best best of all dinners, um, really nice gravy and, and special stuffing with apricots and and pork and uh, meat, and we always have Yorkshire puddings with our, our Christmas dinner. Uh, totally amazing, and um, I'm sure you all have nice Christmas dinners. Uh, they fill you up nicely, you're stuffed, um, but then a couple of hours later, uh, you feel a little bit peckish, and, and the best thing is that you can go back and you find more pigs and blankets, and you find more roast potatoes and a little bit of congealed gravy, and even days after, you can return to the fridge, and there's plenty, isn't there? There's the cooked ham, and there's the peas pudding, all of the wonderful things that we enjoy at Christmas, and sometimes I wish that I had um, the same at Christmas dinner, but uh, for all of life, for my spiritual life, I feel like I'm running on empty, I get to two o'clock uh, most afternoons, and all of my mental and intellectual energies are just zapped from the morning study, and all I can do is kind of dead-minded um, work. You get to Friday, uh, and I feel like the week should end, but I've still got the weekend uh, to work through. I feel completely uh, depleted of energy, and I'm sure uh, you do too. Uh, but we do. We have a feast. We have a Christmas dinner. We have a heavenly feast that is given to us 
by God. And we can go whenever we're feeling empty and peckish and a little weak, and we can go and we can take of that feast and we can eat and we can be satisfied. That's what the passage here is all about. First thing to note is this, that we have mouths to feed. We have mouths to feed. What we have before us is not a miracle about Jesus providing for 5,000 people. I'm sure you've probably done it in Sunday school, or you maybe even heard it preached before, and the focus is on what Jesus has done for the 5,000 people. That is a mistake. What we have here is a miracle of Jesus providing for 5,000 people through the hands of his own disciples. So remember the context in verse 1. Jesus sends the disciples out for the first time on their own. He's preparing them for that time when he is going to ascend to heaven and they must continue his work on earth. And in verse 10, the disciples have returned. And that's still the emphasis in the passage. He sent the disciples out to do his work. And notice what he says to them in verse 13. You give them something to eat. This is not about what Jesus is doing for the people. This is what the disciples are to do in the strength of Jesus for the people. They must give the people something to eat. Now, there's a couple of things to notice here. The first is the tiredness of the disciples. So they have returned from the first time that they have gone out in the name of Christ. No doubt anxious, very busy, uh, and they have preached their hearts out and they have healed their hearts out. And Jesus brings them back in verse 10 and he takes them to this deserted place. Why? Well, Mark tells us he brings them to the deserted place that they might rest a little because they are tired and they're spent and they're, they're exhausted. But then what happens in verse 11, you can imagine they are absolutely gutted. They get to the quiet place. This is like me at the end of a Sunday. And I just want to sit on the sofa and say nothing to anybody. But then the crowds come. Oh, no. (laughs) Finally, we're going to sit with Jesus. We're going to have something to eat. We're going to set out some little beds and we'll sleep under the stars. And it's going to be amazing. And he'll wake us in the morning and he'll pray. But there are these pesky crowds, needy, lost people seeking a shepherd. And as you notice in verse 11, Jesus doesn't send them away. He doesn't say, sorry, we're doing shops closed. But he welcomes them. And then he begins teaching, and he begins healing them. And of course, the disciples are active in all of this. The disciples would be there having conversations on the side. The disciples would be there helping the sick people to Jesus, leading them back to the families. And so you can imagine the disciples' absolute delight when they realize that the day is waning, and it's coming to an end in verse 12, and there's nothing else they can do for the people. They're absolutely delighted. Jesus, Jesus, finally, okay? We've done everything we can. There's nothing else we can give this people. We've got no food to offer them. There's no lodgings here. Let us send them away. And finally, finally, we can get some rest. But Jesus says to the disciples, no, you give them something to eat. You must continue serving. You must continue to pour out your hearts to this people. They are tired. And then there is the impossibility of the task. There are 5,000 people, we're told in verse 14, And as they look and they see, well, what is it that we have to meet this great need and to fulfill Jesus' command? uh, They search amongst themselves and they say, we've got five loaves of bread and we've got two fish. Now, this is pretty much um, my life. Five loaves of bread, two fish and 5,000 mouths to feed. Uh, That's it. Every single day I wake up and that's exactly how I feel. I've got five loaves, I've got two fish and I've got these tasks that are bigger than me. I've got responsibilities that are greater than I can bear. I have to be a faithful uh, pastor. I've got to study the word again, whether I feel like it or not, as we'll consider tonight. I've got to be a good husband to my wife. I've got to be a good father to my children. I've got to be a good neighbor to the people outside. You all have these pressures. Five loaves, two fish, and you've got 5,000 mouths to feed. Why does Jesus put the disciples in this position? Well, he just so because they would find themselves in this exact place again. Notice in verse 14, he asks them to get the people to sit down in groups of 50. Uh, this reminds us of Moses in the wilderness when Jethro comes and his father-in-law, and he advises him to set leaders over the people in thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens. Jesus has come as the new Moses. Here is a picture of Jesus gathering again the Israel of God, preparing the church of God 
There are 5,000 people. Why? Luke doesn't give us too many numbers, but he does give us the number 5,000 in the book of Acts. The church was going to grow rapidly when the Spirit of God was poured out. They began with 120. They grew to 3,000. And by Acts chapter 4 and verse 4, how many people are there? There are 5,000 people gathered in the church. Remember what I've said. This is Jesus preparing the disciples for the time that he is going to ascend into heaven. They would be in this place again. The apostles would be there, 5,000 hungry souls before them, and they with persecution, with heresies, with physical exhaustion, with discouragements would have to fulfill their ministry and feed the 5,000 souls. How are they going to do it? Jesus wants them to know the reality of Christian service. As I say, the reality of my life and the reality of your life, whether you're in ministry or not, God has given you a work to do. Aren't you like the disciples, five loaves, two fish, four, uh, 5,000 mouths to feed? Isn't that you? Whether you think it is or not, I can tell you for sure it is you. Let me ask, how are you doing as a Christian? How are you doing as a father and as a mother? Are you excelling? Are you the best father and best mother that you could be? How are you doing in your witness to Christ? Are you telling others of the good things that God has done for you? How are you doing as a church member? Do you remember for those who became members of this church, you promised to give of your time, talent, and treasure to the church. You promised to be at every member that the elders called as much as was reasonably possible. How are you doing as an employee? You were asked to serve your employer without grumbling and complaining, even if what they ask is unreasonable, with humility, pouring out your heart and soul to your employer. How are you all doing in your holiness and your purity? How are you doing in your love? Do you love your enemies as Christ has commanded you? How are you doing in your humility? Do you live as little children before God? How are you doing in your faith? Is it not filled with doubts? How are you doing in your sacrifice? Do you live a life of sacrifice? Do you daily take up your cross and follow after Jesus? No, you don't most of the time. You are five loaves and two fishes, and you've got 5,000 mouths to fill, but you can't do it, and you don't do it. You fall short constantly. Jesus wants us to see the reality of Christian service. This is what the disciples are up against. This is what the disciples are up against in the book of Acts. This is what we are up against every single day of our lives. He doesn't just want us to see the reality, though. He wants us to see that there is something greater than rest and comfort and ease. And there is something mightier than the impossible work that he calls us to do. And of course, it is him. It is Jesus. He says, and this is the second point, take from me. He tells the disciples, listen, you tell all of the people to sit down in groups of 50 in verse 14. The disciples obey verse 15. They get everybody to sit down in groups of 50. And then in verse 16, he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them. And he gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. Here's what Jesus is saying to the disciples. You take from me. I want you to see that I am more than enough for the work that I have asked you to do. If you would come and take from me, you'll not only be able to meet the needs that I have asked of you, but you will have some left over. And so the disciples in verse 17, they do that. They take the bread from Jesus, the five loaves, the two fish, can you imagine 5,000 people, if you've been to the Aberystwyth Conference, like 1,000, 1,500 or something? So then multiply that four times, and you've got your five loaves and your two fish. And they probably began, the 12 of them, and they divided it into the 12. And then they go around, and they're handing the bread, and somehow the bread keeps coming. The fish keeps coming. Not only do the people all eat, but the people are filled and satisfied and there are 12 baskets left over. If you remember where we began in verse 1, Jesus sends out the 12 disciples. Very clearly, Luke is showing us that each apostle had a full basket left over. Not only were they able to satiate the 5,000, but in taking from Christ, they had this basket full with which to go on and to continue to meet the needs of others. Jesus is saying to the disciples, I am superabundance. My stores for you and for others will never run dry. You take from me.
The translation is this. It might feel for us that we are five loaves and two fish with 5,000 mouths to fill. But Jesus is more than you need for everything that you must do. Now, we know this, don't we? Do you know this? We know that Jesus is all sufficient. We confess it. We talk about it. We sing of it. Uh, We know that he is the one through whom all things have come. And if everything has come through Jesus, then he is able to supply for our service in some particular part of his creation. We know that the fullness of the Godhead dwells within him bodily, that the riches of knowledge and wisdom are found in him. We know that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We know this, don't we? But do you know it? I don't think we actually do know it. See, for me, I live more in verse 13 than I do in verse 16. Lord, all I have is five loaves and two fish, and there are these 5,000 mouths to feed. But I'm not there taking the superabundance of Christ and fulfilling my calling. But here's the good news. My failure to reach out and to take from Jesus and your failure to reach out and to take from Jesus does not change the fact that he is more than I will ever need and more than you will ever need. He is that. Whether we have availed ourselves of his help or not, he is just that. He is this super abundant savior. We all have mouths to feed. Every single day there are things that you do in the service of Christ and you can't do them in your strength but you can do them in the strength of Jesus. We have an all-sufficient Lord. And he welcomes us here through the Spirit. He welcomes us here in his gospel to take from him. As he takes the bread, as he blesses and he breaks it, and he hands it to them. He says, take from me. I am your head. I am your shepherd. I am your Lord. And I'm going to give you everything that you need to do everything that I've asked you to do. And you're even going to have some left over. And so why do we still feel so weak and tired and exhausted? And why do we struggle so much? It is only because we don't take from him. We have to lift up our hands in prayer, empty hands, and to receive grace from heaven as he has promised us. We're to feed ourselves in the word where he opens up his mind and his heart to us that we would know him better, that we would take hold of him, that we would enjoy that relationship, and that we would be enriched by that relationship. The problem for us is that so often we feel Um, overworked and overburdened. And when we do that, you know what we do? We do the exact opposite to what we should do. I do it myself. On the busiest of days, I wake up and I hurry through prayer, if I even pray, pray, and I rush into my work. The exact opposite of what we should be doing. The busier, the more stressed out, the more overwhelmed you are. You must come and take from Jesus. Open the scriptures. Call out to him. Lift up your hands. Open. This is how the Christians prayed. And say, Jesus, fill my hands. Let me take bread from you that I might feed the 5,000. Jesus is sufficient for us. Amazing promise that he gives to us here. Amazing assurance. But then there is something very particular. We've mouths to feed. Take from me. Uh, But thirdly, feast upon me. Now this is super important. We have here a theology of the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is the forgotten jewel of the Christian life. Um, You might say, well, is it so forgotten? Because I do take it. I take it sometimes. I take it occasionally. Well, all right. But if you do take communion every now and then, and if you take it regularly, whatever, let me ask you the question, why? Why do you take communion? Why is it important that you turn up to a communion service and you take the bread and you drink the wine? And you see, the problem is, if you struggle to answer the question, if you're like, well, I don't really know, because for the most part, I continue on, I read my Bible, and I pray, and I can go for two months. I've been for three months. I've been for six months without even taking the bread and wine. You could be forgiven for asking yourself the question, well, what does it actually do, and why do I actually need it? Is it simply just some kind of ritual that we tack on every now and then and say, oh, well, this is nice sometimes? The problem is this. If we can't explain why we need the supper, and I'm not saying that we need perfect understanding, The question is this, how can you take the supper in faith? 
If you do not understand what to anticipate in the supper, how can you receive blessing from the supper? Now, don't get me wrong. All of our understandings need to grow. And so as long as you're coming sincerity with faith because it's just simple obedience, that's, that's fine. But if you don't come expecting the Lord to do something and to give you something in the communion, you ain't going to receive much from the Lord. He rewards faith. He blesses us through faith. And so we have a big problem. Now, the sacrament is a mystery. And we can't explain every detail of it. But one of the reasons the sacrament is hard for us to understand is because we overlook passages that show us what the sacrament does. And that's not because the passages are veiled or hidden. It's because we're not looking. It's because we're out of practice. It's because we have a small view of a very big gift. So here is a communion text. Let me say unmistakably, this is a communion text. If you want to know what does the supper do, you look here to the feeding of the 5,000. Listen again in verse 16. Jesus, he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed, or he gave thanks, the two are interchangeable, he broke them, and he gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. Now, now listen to Mr. Bock. Mr. Bock is a leading Luke scholar. The greatest commentaries for most people in most people's minds on the book of Acts and the book of Luke are written by Mr. Bock. He doesn't come to the right conclusion. Um, I don't, well, people always have their prejudices when they study a text. But he has the right analysis. Listen to this. All five verbal actions are part of all the synoptics. All... But the second action, that is Jesus looking up to heaven, reoccur in the Last Supper accounts. All five verbal actions, all of the synoptics, all of them, with the exception of Jesus looking up to heaven, are there in the Last Supper accounts. Okay, so just listen to it for yourself. Acts 20, uh, sorry, Luke 22 and verse 19. This is the, the, the upper room, Jesus inaugurating the sacrament at Passover. And he took bread and he gave bread thanks or blessed, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying. The exact sequence of verbs, Luke is deliberately tying the two. And then you turn to the road, uh, the Emmaus Road experience in Luke 24 and verse 30, and listen again. Now it came to pass, he sat at the table with them, and he took bread, and he blessed and he broke it, and he gave it to them. And it is then that their eyes were opened, and they knew Jesus as he is breaking bread before them. And then the shorthand comes through the disciples as they return to the rest of the disciples in verse 35 of that text. And they told them about the things that had happened to them and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. That's the shorthand for communion. And that's what Luke uses in Acts 2 and verse 42 for the sacrament within the life of the church. So then the question for us all is this, why is Jesus making, and the Spirit, and Luke, making an explicit connection between this miracle and the supper. We're not saying the feeding of the 5,000 is the Lord's Supper. They're having bread and fish. They're not having bread and wine. Nevertheless, the connection is well established and concrete. The reason is because the miracle of the 5,000 explains the miracle of the Lord's Supper. We're not given here a scientific and rational explanation as to how everything works. What we are given is a powerful picture that is to be received by faith. And this is the picture. Just as Christ said to the disciples, you give them something to eat. These weary, exhausted disciples look out at the crowd of 5,000 and they say, we can't do it. We have five loaves and two fish. But then he takes them and he lifts them up to heaven and he breaks them, and he blesses them, and he hands them to them, and then they have strength. Then they have abundance to feed the 5,000. This is exactly what he is doing in the supper. We come, and we have these tasks and responsibilities that have been given to us by God. We need grace in order to serve Christ, to serve Christ in our families, in our workplace, and in our, in our neighborhoods, and we can't do it. We have five loaves, and we have two fish, and there are 5,000 mouths to feed, but as we come, and as we take from Jesus the sacred bread, and we drink 
drink the sacred wine, do you know what he does? He takes it and he gives us that strength and he gives us that energy. He gives us his grace with which to go out and to serve the lives of others, to fulfill our holy calling. It could not be clear. Here is the picture. Here is what is happening in the supper. Now you ask yourself, isn't it just bread and wine? Absolutely, it's just bread and wine. And you know what? It was just five loaves and it was just two fish. But with the blessing of the almighty Christ, the ordinary was taken and it was used for extraordinary means. That is what is happening to us. What happened on this day as he fed the 5,000 was a miracle. But what happens for us every single Sunday, or at least every time we come to the communion table, is a miracle. We come, men of flesh and blood, to simple bread and wine. But as it is set apart by the word with prayer, ordained of Christ, he takes the ordinary bread and he takes the ordinary wine and he gives his super abundant self to us that we would have the energy, that we would have the life, that we would have the power that we need to serve him. Why is the church struggling so much? One of the reasons is because the church is not availing itself of the help that Christ has laid up for it. It's not simply a question of whether you take the bread and you drink the wine. It's a question of whether you take the bread and you drink the wine with understanding. If you don't come to the table expecting to receive power and grace from Christ, to receive Christ himself, you're not going to know the fullness of that blessing. If you come with a mind that is informed, if you take the, the miracle of the 5,000 and you understand that here this ordinary bread and ordinary wine is able to give to you Christ's superabundance that you might fulfill your calling, then you will receive the superabundance of Christ. Not just to go out this week and fulfill your, your work and, and the tasks you have, but even with some left over. So here's what I would ask you to do. First, I would say repent of a low view of the sacrament. If you think that the sacrament is an add-on and it's not really doing anything, I would say repent of that. Christ has given it to you in love to help you. You're trying to serve him without his help. That, that's crazy. Repent of it. But then open your mind. Go back, study the passage for yourself. Go to the feeding of the 5,000. See the tie with communion. Understand that the ordinary is used for the extraordinary. Jesus has called us to serve him, to take up our cross. It's a hard thing to do. But here he has given us heavenly food. Here he has spread before us a heavenly feast. Here he gives to us our Christmas dinner, where we can go and we can gorge ourselves. And then when we feel a little peckish, we can return again and we can be filled. And three days later, we can return again and we can be filled and if you understand this, you see, then a communion service will be the highlight and the priority of your week. If you understand that it is here that Christ has given himself to us, there is nothing in heaven or on earth that would keep you from coming here. Because if you're not coming here in faith with humble dependence, you're seeking to serve in your own strength, or you're seeking to serve without the fullness of Christ's strength. And so, dear brothers and sisters, understand, you are just five loaves and two fish. There are 5,000 hungry mouths to feed every single day. God is asking of you more than you can do. But he says, take, take from me. We take him, of course, in the word. We take him as we pray to him. But he has appointed the communion service. However frequently your church does it, he has appointed it. And he says, here especially you come. And when you take the bread and you take the wine in faith, I will make it that you will feed 5,000. You will meet the things that I ask of you and you will have a basket left over. And so let us uh, avail ourselves of the help. Uh, what a gift Christ has given to us here in communion. Amen.